So let's go ahead and get started. So for Irish record research, I mean, we're all gonna know that we have to start at the beginning. So you start with yourself, you work your way backwards until you get to that Irish immigrant ancestor that came over. You're going to exhaust every nook and cranny in the United States, if that's where your Irish ancestor settled, um, to find records. Because the bottom line is we need to find either a town of origin or at least a county. Records are not in one central location in Ireland. They're kind of scattered about and you need to kind of narrow down your search. So that's why we suggest that if they naturalize, find a naturalization record. If they're on the censuses, find census records. Because uh, as we know, some of the census records will list date of naturalization or whether or not they naturalized or when they immigrated. So you wanna be sure you take a look at those uh, census records, land records, wills and probate records, uh, church records, especially if your ancestors came from the south of Ireland, because they will more likely be Roman Catholic, and the Catholics are very good at keeping records. And like I said, we're going to be looking at all sources. Uh, not only census records and voter lists and registrations, but also vital records, birth, marriage, and death, uh, cemetery records, passenger lists, a lot of passenger lists, especially those if they immigrated in the late 1800s, or early 1900s, might have information on where they came from, uh, relatives if they still know, and social media is one of those new avenues that you can utilize, even though it's been around a while, but we have found that more and more social media groups dedicated to genealogy research are popping up all the time. And there are quite a few Irish related groups. You can join those for free. You can ask questions. I've had luck with actually having um, a document that I needed that was not online. It was only in an archive in an area in Ireland. And there was a gentleman who was living in that area in Ireland on this social media group. And he was more than kind enough to go to the place I needed, find the document and send me a copy. So uh, if you are Facebook, on Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest or Instagram or any of those groups, if you see an Irish group that looks like you know Southern Irish or Galway, if that was the location where your ancestors came from, Join those groups. You never know what you're gonna learn from those different groups. And here's an example of an 1886 passenger list. This is a list from New York. And I found this on Ancestry. And basically what it's going to tell you is, for this particular one, it tells us about the name of the person so uh, Ms. Oni Fitzmorris tells her birth date about 1862, uh, the date she arrived, which is at the top. Uh, she sailed from Liverpool, England, and Queenstown, Ireland on the ship Nevada. She was 24 years old, and she came from Tipperary. There's, the, there's our clue, Tipperary. So that's where we're going to focus our search if this young lady is indeed one of our ancestors. This is one of the reasons why the uh, passenger lists are so important. Now, of course, you're gonna find some earlier passenger lists may say just a name, you know, and it says Ireland's where they're from. But again, you're going to narrow down some pieces of information for them. And then don't forget newspapers. Newspapers are a very important source. Um, especially the Boston Pilot. Even if they weren't living in Boston at the time, a lot of times they would have come through Boston, maybe moving west. And there was an advertisement section in the Boston Pilot searching for missing friends uh, from 1831 to 1920. Here's an example of one of those particular entries for November 12th of 1831. 
uh, John Delahunty of Clonmore County Tipperary. He arrived in the United States in 1818. He boarded at the house of a Mr. William Gleason in Boston. His nephew has arrived and he has something important to communicate to him. So any information respecting him directing to Mr. William Gleason or Michael Delahunty. Uh, so right there, we have information, say John Delahunty is one of your ancestors. Uh, we know that the town he came from, Clonmore, and the county was Tipperary. He arrived in 1818, and he was in Boston for a, a period of time. So maybe there is a census record that might give you some more information, or there might be other information in necessary under Mr. William Gleason, because he was a boarder at the time. So you've got a lot of information in this one small paragraph. Ireland has been through a lot of natural disasters and man-made disasters. And a lot of their records have been lost or destroyed. So when you finally get around to going over to the Emerald Isle to look for records there, you're going to need to know the jurisdictions of Ireland, how they were separated, where your ancestor lived, and their religion because church records will be an important source for information when you finally cross over to Ireland. Also too, the history of Ireland is going to be important. It's going to kind of tell you what kind of records might be available out there as well as whether or not there might be records still extant and available to you. Um, it's going to affect migration. It's going to affect tax records and land records, as well as census records, vital church and probate records. Um, we do have each of these particular categories available in Irish records. Whether or not they will pertain to your ancestor, that's where the research will come in. Also, too, remember, too, that a lot of the Irish may not have owned land, they may have rented land from someone, so the land owner itself might have also information regarding your ancestor. Since the landowner would have paid taxes on the land, and if there was any surveys done on renters on the land, the tenants would be available on those particular records. And here are a couple of uh, instances that would be very important to you while you're researching. For example, in 1801, we have the Acts of Union. This is where Ireland became part of the United Kingdom. In 1829, we have the Catholic Emancipation or the Catholic Relief Act. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a bit. And then naturally in the middle, we have the Great Irish Famine in the 1840s as well as the first home rule bill in 1861, where the Irish were trying to become self-governing. They wanted to break away from, from England and uh, rule themselves. So that is also going to affect records in the country. And then we get to the many jurisdictions of Ireland. Um, a lot of these nowadays no longer apply, but for historical purposes, they do. So you start out with the four provinces, Ulster, Connacht, Leinster, and Munster. Then you get down to the county level. Down from there, you're also going to get the barony, the poor law union, the parishes. And there are two types of parishes, civil and ecclesiastical. And under the ecclesiastical, they will be further divided into the Anglican Church or the Church of Ireland and the Roman Catholic Church. And then the smallest unit of measure will be the townland. So here, here's a, a little map of the different counties within the provinces. And you will notice that Ulster has two colors, purple and red. And that's because of a political division between Ulster, the actual province, and Northern Ireland, the political division. So 
So the difference between Ulster and Northern Ireland. Okay, Ulster is the province. It's been around for centuries. And you have Donegal, Derry, Tyrone, Fermanagh, Cavan, Monaghan, Armand, uh, Antrim, and Down as the counties within that particular province. But when, after the Irish Civil War in the 1920s, those particular counties were given the option. You can either go with the Republic or you can stay with England. And several and six of those decided to stay. And they're the what is considered Northern Ireland. The confusion comes in where um, the political parties, for example, the unionists who wanted to stay with England, they're trying to separate themselves from Ireland entirely, even though they're on the same island as the Republic. So they may call Northern Ireland Ulster instead of Northern Ireland, but it's still a political division as opposed to the uh, province itself. And then here's a further indication of the different uh, counties within the different provinces. So for example, for Munster in the green, you've got County Clare, County Limerick, County Tipperary, Cary, Cork, and Waterford. And then you'll also notice that they divided Ulster up to the red, which was the three that stayed with the Republic, and then the six that stayed with England. And this is a very important distinction when you're looking at records too, because some records might be up north, some might be down south. So the next division we're gonna talk about is poor law unions. These were created to administer relief to the poor around 1838 under the Poor Law Act. Um, they also use these divisions in census records and other records as well. Later, they just created dispensary districts within the poor law unions where they would provide medical assistance. Usually the poor law union or the workhouse, which is what was created would be in a market town. Uh, for, and this, the example we show here is Canock. And on the right, you see the different poor law unions that were in that particular province. Notice too, when you see divisions such as this, that they don't necessarily stay within provincial boundaries or county boundaries. They may kind of go over them a little bit here and there, but for the most part, they will be kind of attached to a particular province or a particular county. Now, if uh, this George Handra's book, Townlands in Poor Law Unions, is a really good book if you need to find out specific names of the poor law unions that were in effect at this time. By the late 1800s, the poor law unions were changed to superintendent registrar districts, simply because of the fact the name poor law union had a really bad connotation and they were trying to say that Ireland was not in that bad of shape by that time. So they would, it's the same division, it's just a different name. Um, so if you're looking for like um, the divisions, this is a good book to look at. It will tell you the different um, superintendent registrar districts organized by the PLU and it has a list of talents within those divisions that you can narrow down your search for. Also too, we have baronies. Um, these are very, very old territorial divisions. Um, basically they were in place back when the Celtic tribes and the Irish chieftains were in power. Um, they were focusing mainly on property valuation and ownership. A long time ago, a barony would have been awarded to someone in recognition of service to the English monarchs. Um, it'll usually be a subdivision of a county. So we're going from province to county to barony. 
uh, one of the particular documents that you might be looking at would be the old age pension claims that occurred after 1908. These are organized by barony, then by civil parish within the barony, which is why you would need to know the barony as well as the civil parish in order to look those up because that's how they were divided. And um, we have an example here of some of the baronies in one particular location. And you can see there's no rhyme or reason about how they were divided. And then we have parishes. This is sort of like the basic unit. Um, if you were talking to an Irishman and said, you know, where are you from? Nine times out of 10, he's gonna tell you the parish they're from as opposed to, well, I'm from Ireland or I'm from County Ulster or whatever. They're gonna say, you know, I I'm from this particular parish. And there's two types. So we have the civil parishes which usually were pretty much the same boundaries as the Church of Ireland or the Anglican Church, which was the established church until 1870. Then we have the Roman Catholic parishes. Um, they may have the same name as the civil parish, or they may have a totally different name, and they may have different boundaries as well. If you're looking for, say, um, not only were Catholics and Anglicans, they were the two major religions, but you also have Presbyterians, Quakers, Methodists, and other religious denominations as well, and they would have their own particular congregations in certain locations. And here's an example. This is County Waterford. Now, on the left, we've got the civil parishes. On the right, we've got the Roman Catholic parishes, and you can see there's a vast difference between the two. Um, for example, if you were looking at Area 54 there, and you were trying to figure out, that's the civil parish, and you'll see there's at least two, maybe three Catholic parishes within that division. So it is going to be a difference, even though you may know the civil parish looking for particular birth, marriage, and death records on the civil side, you might need to go further into one of those particular Catholic parishes to find the church records. And then the smallest unit we have are townlands. There's about 61,000 of them. They were named after topographical or man-made features. Um, and there is no rhyme or reason for these as well. They could have been a few acres in size or they could be a thousand acres in size. Um, sometimes the townland and the county will have the same name. Sometimes the townland, the county, and there might be a city with the same name. Dublin is one of those that pops up constantly. Um, so you need to be aware of whether or not in the context of the record you're looking at, whether they're talking about the townland or a town or a, a county or a parish. And you will find that there are several townlands in a parish, depending on the size of the parish. And here's an example. So if we look at Leitrim, which is that dark green up there near Elster, you'll see there's the county. Then in the, in the center, we have the Catholic parishes. And then on the right, we have the townlands. And again, there is no rhyme or reason. Some of those townlands cross county boundary lines because you'll see the shape of the that whole area of townlands does not match the county. They go over a little bit on some of those, but you'll see there's a total difference. So if I'm looking from my ancestor in this county and I know the uh, Catholic parish, I'm going to have to go a little further division wise and look for the what which townland would be the one I need to look for records. And the bottom line for all of those divisions is if you can make sense of those divisions, the rest of this is smooth sailing. So what we're gonna talk about today is the early and late colonial periods. 
um, pre-1717 and then 1717 to 1783. And next week, next Wednesday, same time, um, we're going to talk about from 1783 down to the end of the 20th century. So the first thing we need to remember about this earlier period is that for most of the history of Ireland, England wanted Ireland to belong to England as opposed to the Irish. And by doing that, they needed to settle with their people in Ireland. And one of the first kings who was successful in doing that was King James I. Uh, this was around the early 1600s. He was the first king who was successful in colonizing Ulster. They started in the north and they were going to plan on working their way south. Um, so lords and gentry from England and Scotland were given areas of land to settle. Um, so were veterans of the Irish wars who fought on the English side. Uh, some of the London companies, uh, Trinity College, and the established church got uh, land as well. And there were two divisions. Uh, they had, um, the first division was if um, you got a large area of land, you could build a castle on it with fortifications and you could rent that land out to English or Scottish tenants. Uh, if you got a smaller parcel of land, you could build a house on it instead of a castle and you could rent to the Irish tenants. And it was your choice on what you wanted to do as long as you stayed loyal to the crown. And uh, the map on the right is kind of like the divisions. Um, you'll see a lot of areas where mainly the English settled, other areas where mainly the Scots settled. And then there'll be some areas where there's a combination of the two. And this will be up in the north, in, in Ulster itself, the province. It's also around this time that we are introduced to the penal laws. When colonization wasn't working as quickly and as effectively as they thought it would, uh, the English monarchs decided to enforce penal laws on what they called non-dissenters or anyone who was practicing a religion other than the Church of Ireland. So they forced the Irish Catholic and Protestant dissenters to accept the reformed Christian faith as defined by the English state established Anglican Church. The Anglican Church was the only legal church in Ireland at the time period and everybody else was forced to either adopt the new church or not practice religion at all. Uh, a lot of the things that they uh, had in the penal laws was laws against practicing your religion, uh, voting, holding land, um, even certain laws within these penal laws um, could, if a, uh, priest was caught practicing, say, the Catholic faith, he could actually be put to death if he was caught. So there was a lot of forcefulness in these laws to um, try to get the Irish people to convert to the Anglican church. So keep church registers. This is the important part here. Um, a lot of the times during this time period, they were forbidden, the Catholics were forbidden from keeping registers. So there were no baptisms, there were no marriage records, um, burial records. Um, the only thing you might be able to find, if indeed, and we do know this for a fact, because there were some places that continued to keep registers, uh, but they didn't do it where everybody knew about it. So you might be able to find a particular church register for a particular, during this time period, if you're lucky. Um, they couldn't receive an education or hold a public office, couldn't engage in trade or commerce. So basically, really the only thing they could do is farm their land, but they couldn't sell what they were farming. But if the landlord wanted it, he could take it and sell it. They couldn't own the land or lease the land, but they could rent. 
Um, they couldn't keep arms for their protection and they couldn't be a guardian to a child, even if it was in their family. So some of the records and sources, if you're looking for Irish ancestors that came over to the US early, so we're talking pre-1717, um, and we'll show the census substitutes in a moment, but we also have some deeds, 2% of the population. So if your ancestor was lucky enough to own land, you might find something there, or if the landlord was selling the land, he might have made a particular mention of the tenants on the land. So there might be, if your ancestor was the tenant or the occupier, there might be a mention of them in the deed. Uh, memorials. Um, the Irish Genealogy Project has a headstone project that they're doing. Uh, this is the web address where they are going around and, you know, just like a find a grave, they are making note of all the different memorials. Um, also the Registry of Deeds project is in place as well. Neither one of these are completely finished, but they are in the process of trying to find all the deeds and put them in a database for people to search. Uh, estate papers, again, is another, your ancestor may not have left a will, but they might be mentioned in one. And then Passenger and Immigration Index, which is uh, edited by William Philby, which we call just the Philbys. Uh, if you're looking for that passenger list for your particular ancestor, um, it is online on Ancestry.com. It is not available on Ancestry LE, which is the library edition, but you can find it on the .com version. We also, at least, here, as well as some other libraries, you might have the actual book copies that you can take a look through. Sure. So you also, uh, MyHeritage also has them. Do, does now have them? Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can also look at MyHeritage if you're interested in checking out the Philbys. Census substitutes, land records and land surveys, uh, deeds, muster rolls. Subsidy rolls or records of taxation, which go back as far as the 12th century. Church records, depositions. Maybe the landowner or even your particular ancestor had to go to court for some reason. Uh, and you might be able to find his mention in a deposition. And then estate records. Uh, the National Archives of Ireland has an overview. The Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, or as everybody calls it, PRONI because that's the abbreviation, has advice for exploring paper collections. Remember too, that not everything is online, but a lot of these locations do have free services. So if there is a particular document that you are looking for, you can always contact them and request it. And then we have church records. Uh, if you're looking for baptism or marriage records before 1864, which is around the time of civil registration, you're gonna be looking at church records. Uh, burial registers, there's about 20% of them out there. And at the time they weren't very, they didn't have a lot of information on them. There might be the name of the deceased and the date of the burial, not necessarily the date of death. Um, and if anybody's been at any of the special interest groups that we do on Irish or classes, John Granham is pretty much what I would consider the Yoda of Irish research. Um, Tracing Your Irish Ancestors is the name of his book. He, it's now in the fifth edition. He also has a website, um, johngranham.com, and that should be on your handout. So if you're looking for a particular, some particular information and find out when church records start for a particular area that you're looking for, you can check out uh, Brenham's site. Um, there are other places, uh, other, you know, Prony has some information on that, as well as the uh, General Record Office of the Republic or the General Record Office of Ireland is what it's called, also has information as well. But Grenham's is all in one place. It's really a good location to start your, your search. And then here are some websites. 
Um, the Family History Foundation it is a subscription-based website, but they do have some free stuff on there. Irish Genealogy is a free site. That is the Republic of Ireland's government site. You can find indexes on li Ancestry Library Edition. You can find some records as well as indexes on Family Search, Grenham site, Irish Ancestors. Find My Past has a ton of Irish records. Uh, it is subscription-based. We have a library edition here. So if you're not in locally here in this area, you might have a library close to you that also has a subscription to Find My Past. Um, search the net. If you're looking for, say, records from Waterford, type in Waterford County genealogy records and see what pops up. A lot of the counties themselves have their own websites that have genealogy research information as well. And then the Ulster History Foundation, which is a paid site, um, but they do have some free uh, information on there, as well as for those of you here in class or online that is in our area, um, we are having these folks, the Ulster History Foundation coming in for a free seminar on March the 16th next Thursday. Next Thursday. Mm -hmm. And um, they're going to be coming in here to talk about uh, the North as well as the South and records that you can find and where to find them. They also have a lot of different publications that they have published and they do sell on their website. They have some very awesome books in case you're interested on how to find your ancestors. Then we move to the late colonial period. This is where uh, migration starts to become a major factor, 1717, 1783. This is also around the time of the American Revolution where you will find a lot of the Irish participated on the side of the Americans um, in that particular war. So we have five waves of migration at this time and the reasons for those migration waves. Starting in 1770-1718, you know, we have a drought that occurs. Uh, and it, Ireland has, has witnessed a lot of droughts, a lot of famines, besides the Great Famine. Uh, rack renting, which was excessive rent for property. A lot of the times that the landowners decided that they could get more money from somebody else, they would raise the rent on the tenants. Tenants couldn't pay, so they'd be evicted, and then they would... Uh, have to leave and then the landowner would uh, rent out to the new tenant who's paying more. Uh, diminished trade in wool. That was one of the major areas that Ireland was noted for, as well as persecution. We just talked about the penal laws. Well, you know, if you can't pretty much practice your religion or vote or own land or do this or do that, you know, you're going to probably want to move somewhere that will allow you the freedom to do as you please. Um, then we have the second wave. Another drought occurred during that time period, as well as food became a scarcity, as well as other provisions. Rack renting was still going on and silver shorted. There was a silver shortage. So the money that was printed off in silver, there was a shortage of that. So people couldn't buy things at this particular point. And the poorer you were, all, you were, the less likely you would have silver to pay for something. And then in 1740, 1741, there was a famine that occurred. So that would be your third wave. Uh, in 1754 and 55, we have our fourth wave of migration, uh, another drought, and effective propaganda. Um, the English decided that during this time period, if you can't beat them by penal laws or moving in other people from other countries, let's just start a propaganda and say, go to America, it's great there. So they would start these propaganda campaigns where the, the ships would be offering lower pay for a trip and they would send them across the Atlantic to either Canada or the US. So a lot of people would immigrate at that particular time period. And then rack renting was the last one. Again, once again, the landowners would raise their rent and the people would have to leave. And if they didn't have any place to go, the next 
option would be to immigrate. So if your ancestors were not Catholic or Anglican, but Presbyterian, there is a good book out there on the uh, Presbyterian church, which would give you information on where to look for records as well as what records you might find. Um, this other book of the history of is also an interesting book. Uh, research in your Scotch Irish ancestors is if your ancestors came from the North and were previously Scottish, moved to Ireland, stayed there for a couple of generations, and then may have immigrated to the US. Um, that's a good book to give you information. For the North, again, the Public Record Office, Northern Ireland. Uh, census substitutes would be another thing. We talked about land records and church records, et cetera. Those would be substitutes because a lot of the census records during these early time periods were lost. And that, and that concludes what we have for the first half of the course. Um, we have our address, our phone number, our website, and our email address. We do queries. We also do free consults. So if you are interested, if you have a particular document that you're trying to locate or a particular ancestor that you're trying to find, uh, where do I go to find information on this ancestor? Do email us and we will have our query service take a look for you. If you're looking for a consult, feel free to contact us and say, you know, I need an hour long consult on, you know, what do I, what are my next steps for finding my Irish or finding my German or finding whatever. Uh, we have that as well. Uh, you can give us a call. You can check out what we have on our website and see what kind of information we might have here available that we might want to look into for you folks. Uh, we have an online catalog of all the books that we currently house. Uh, if you need a look up in one of those, feel free to let us know and we'll take a look and see if we can find your ancestor in them. Um, at this point, I think it's time for questions. So let's start online. Mary, do we have a question from our online people? Nothing so far. Okay. How about here in class? You good? What kind of uh, records would be in parish uh, records? Okay. The question was, what kind of records would we find in parish records? You're going to find, basically, you're going to find vital records such as birth, marriage, and death. It would be called baptisms as opposed to birth, but baptism, marriages, and death records. Um. The Irish weren't quite as um, particular as some of the other European countries. For example, in Italy, for example, if you had a birth occur, and nine times out of 10, in these particular time periods, it would be at, at someone's home. It'd be a midwife that was helping. Um, they would actually have you bring the child into the parish, not only for the baptism, but also to to create the record for the birth. Um, the Irish would probably, the, most times the Irish didn't do that. They would come in, the father or the midwife would come in to register the child. Um, marriages, you would have the couple come in. Uh, in the Catholic church, they would have to advertise. So there might be um, marriage bans available, which just said there was an announcement on the church for three Sundays if indeed they were able to practice their religion during that time period. So this would probably be after the penal laws were repealed and we'll get into that next time. But they would say, you know, so-and-so is going to marry so-and-so on this particular date. If you have any reason why these people should not be married, let us know. Or you might even find uh, witness documents, you know, cause they would at least have to have at least two witnesses to perform the marriage ceremony and say, yes, they can, they should be married and all this. Um, but that those would be the three types I would find in a parish register. Unless you were of a Presbyterian, which is mostly from the Scottish area, a lot of times they would have what they call Kirk sessions, where the um, group of heads of the particular congregation would get together and uh, if there was a particular person who was not behaving according to the rules uh, of uh, decorum for that particular congregation, they would have them come before the congregation and 
it would be sort of like, you shouldn't have been doing this. This is your penance, et cetera, et cetera. So there might be some of those documents. But again, what we're looking at here is stuff for after those laws, the penal laws were repealed. But for this time period, you would find birth or baptism, marriages and death or burial records. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. On, on the Donegal County, um, since at one point in time it was uh, part of the um, Ulster province, would that affect research during that time period going back that far or would? Um, what? It depends on whether or not you're looking at the political part of it, or if you're just looking at, you know, birth, marriage, death, civil registration, land records, that sort of thing. Mo since Ulster, the province itself, is you're going to find those three counties probably be in the public record office of the Republic, but the six counties that stayed with England, which is considered Northern Ireland, that's where you'd go to the public record office of Northern Ireland for that information. Still not? Got some more information. Go for it. Seems like they had a lot of town lands. There's 60,000 town lands, but there was only like 6 million. I mean, there was a town land, land for every 100 people. Yeah, um, because of the, and, and it depends on what they were using the town lands for. Because they what they were trying to do is they would take a very large body, such as, you know, Ulster, the province, and then they try to narrow it down so that as they were doing whatever survey they were doing, whatever census they were doing, they could narrow it down to a small portion. And that way, within that particular area, they would know, okay, maybe I need so many police officers or constables for that particular area, as opposed to this area, which is so small, you know, maybe we don't need anything like that for that. Or maybe we're going to give, because um, the church was responsible for giving aid to the poor at the beginning. Um, so maybe this particular area doesn't need a workhouse, but if we combine it with this other area and we use this market town as the central location, then we can put our workhouse there and all of these people would be required to go to that particular workhouse as opposed to another county, which might have maybe one, maybe two, depending on the size. Because like cities like Dublin, they, they was just the city itself had their own public workhouse because it was so big, but they tried to narrow it down. It's, it's sort of like when you go, you have your country, US country, you have your state, you have your counties within your state, you have your other districts within those counties, you know, you just kind of narrow it down to give it more of a manageable number. Yeah, just starting to get into some of my research before, family members immigrated here. Um, I did find a cemetery that connected with family members. Would that, would I assume that that cemetery is located in the uh, Cowland or the uh, jurisdiction that I should focus on? Okay, the question is, he's located a cemetery and he's wondering if that's where he should focus his research in that particular area. Um, are you sure that your ancestors were buried in that cemetery? Yes. Okay. Um, then I would start there as a point and branch out. Because normally, it's very rare for there to be a family cemetery. So if you have one that has a lot of your ancestors buried in that location, then I'm going to assume, and another thing too, if you've run into a brick wall with that particular location that you're trying to locate in Ireland, look at the people that settled around those folks that you're looking for. Because nine times out of 10, when they came over, they settled in areas with people from the same area because they stayed in groups. It was more of a comfort thing. I mean, if you're gonna travel you know, thousands of miles to another country to, to make a basically start over from scratch, there's gotta be some sort of stress reliever or comfort zone. And normally that would be settling with other people just like you from the same area. 
Yes, you got one online. Yes. Is there a name distribution with name variation site by county, by county, or parish to parish, or a site showing the different spellings of place names of various government levels, city, town, county, parish, etc.? JohnGrenham.com. If you type in the surname, let's say, we'll, we'll go with one of the, the common ones, Kelly, the surname Kelly. If you type in Kelly into the, Brenham's website. He will give you a map that shows you the different locations where the name of Kelly occurred during Griffin's valuation, which was in the 1800s. And then he will further divide it into, um, let's say, County Down. You had this many people with the last name of Ken Kelly. Maybe County Galway, you had this many people with the last name of Kelly, et cetera, et cetera. And then from there, you can break it down further to parishes and townlands. So uh, as I said, Grenham's website is a great one to get your research started in Ireland, especially by surname, if you're gonna go that route. Because if you'll notice, you'll see a lot of Williams, a lot of Johns, a lot of James, a lot of Marys. The, there weren't a whole lot of variation in given names as well as and a whole lot of variation of surnames. And uh, one of our topics for one of our future Irish special interest groups is going to be the surnames and the common sur the top 20 common surnames in Ireland. Uh, Kelly is one of them. So if you have a Mary Kelly, your search is going to be difficult, but it's not impossible. But Grenham site would be the one I would go to to check the surname and see where they where the big clumps of that particular surname is located. I used um, I use Grenham's website because I have surnames of Bailey, and you would think Bailey would be an English surname, but I found out that not only could it be an English surname, it could be a Scottish surname, as well as an Irish surname. And I subsequently found out that they were mostly congregated up in the north. So I knew my search was going to be narrowing down to Ulster. And I come to find out later after doing a lot of research that I have Scots-Irish or Ulster Scots as they call it, ancestry. So I go from the United States on that particular side of my family to Ulster and then to Scotland which I didn't realize I had Scottish ancestors until I started delving into my Irish ancestors. So you never know where the, the path will take you, but. They would also like, no, will that include the interrogant in the top 20? No, not in the top 20, but it is up there. Um, and there's a question. Is the Irish group that you mentioned mm -hmm. online? Yes, um, we have, it's going to, it's every three months and it's going to be the first full weekend of that particular month. And what we do is we split it up into two ways. Um, we do an in-person one on the Saturday and then we do one that's online on the Sunday. So if you're interested in that, the next time it comes up, cause we just had it this past weekend. So the next time it comes up, feel free to register for that event online if that's your preference. Other questions? Are we good? Well, okay then. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I'm gonna go ahead and say we're good for today. Uh, hopefully most of you will come back next week and we will do the second half of our class where we'll get into some very interesting political talk as well as a lot of record searching. Um, but until that time, um, you know, for the, you folks here in, in class, be sure to leave uh, your survey. And for you folks online, you will get yours in about 24 hours. So feel free to free, bring that, uh, fill that out and send it back to us. And I thank you all for attending. And I hope to see you guys all again next week. <laughs>